The topic of hormones and receptors is discussed in this screencast. Information on this subject may be found in Chapter 9 of your textbook. This screencast was designed to achieve the following objectives. Explain the relationship between the chemistry of a hormone and its mechanism of action, that is, how it affects the target cell. List six steroid hormones. Describe hormone agonists and antagonists. Now let's talk about how a hormone causes changes in its target cell. So a hormone is released by a secreting cell. That hormone then travels in the blood to a target cell. But how does it cause changes in that target cell? Well, in a similar manner that a neurotransmitter causes changes in its target cell, a hormone binds a receptor on or in the target cell, and in response to the binding to that receptor, changes occur in the metabolism of that cell. The chemical reactions occurring in that cell change. Now, receptors are very specific to a hormone. A receptor for insulin is only going to bind insulin. It's not going to bind growth hormone or progesterone or testosterone or estrogen. Receptors are very specific to a hormone. The specificity of receptors for hormones are illustrated by this figure from your book. Here we have two different hormones, one color-coded in pink being produced by a neuron. And yes, neurons, certain neurons do produce hormones. They're called neuroendocrine cells. And we have a hormone color-coded in green being produced by this gland at the bottom of the figure. Let's look first at the pink color-coded hormone. So this hormone enters the blood and is transported to the cell at the top of the figure. The cell at the top of the figure does not have receptors for that hormone and therefore will not be affected in any way by the hormone. However, this cell at the bottom of this figure has horm receptors specific to that hormone that hormone will bind to that receptor. In response, changes will occur in that target cell, which will lead to apoptosis or program cell death. So the cell at the top will be unaffected by that hormone because it lacks receptors for that hormone, but the cell at the bottom will be affected by that hormone because it has receptors for that hormone. Now let's look at the hormone that is color-coded in green. Our cell at the bottom of the screen, which will be affected by the pink color-coded hormone, lacks receptors for the green color-coded hormone and therefore will be unaffected by that specific hormone. However, our cell at the top does have receptors specific to that green color-coded hormone, therefore when that hormone binds its receptors, it will cause changes in that cell, in this particular case, which will cause that cell to undergo mitosis and cytokinesis, essentially dividing. Now what this illustrates is that, again, receptors are very specific to a hormone. It also shows how a hormone can affect certain cells while having no effect on other cells. If cells don't have receptors for a specific hormone, they're going to be unaffected by that hormone. So essentially, it's the receptors that determines the effect that a hormone will have on a specific cell. Let's talk a little bit more about the binding of hormones to their receptors. Some receptors are found on the extracellular surface of the plasma membrane. However, other receptors are found in the cytoplasm and in the nucleus. In other words, in the intracellular fluid. However, 
only lipid soluble hydrophobic hormones can bind to intracellular receptors. Now my question is why? Why is that the case? Why can charged hormones, hydrophilic hormones, not bind to intracellular receptors? Think about that for just a moment. Again, why can only lipid-soluble hydrophobic hormones bind to intracellular receptors? Well, it all has to do with the plasma membrane. If you remember, the plasma membrane is composed of two layers of phospholipids. And the interior of the phospholipid bilayer is composed of hydrophobic lipids, the fatty acid chains. Therefore, the plasma membrane only lets nonpolar hydrophobic substances diffuse across it. This is a figure from your book showing you how oxygen and carbon dioxide diffuse down their concentration gradients across the plasma membrane. Why can they do that? They can do that because they're nonpolar. And they're also small, but mainly because they're nonpolar. Only nonpolar hydrophobic hormones can pass through the plasma membrane to bind intracellular receptors. Charged hormones like amino acids or proteins or polypeptides can only bind to receptors on the extracellular surface of the plasma membrane because they're charged and cannot pass through the plasma membrane. Now that you have an understanding that lipid soluble hormones can cross the plasma membrane of their target cells and bind intracellular receptors, let's look more closely at the mechanism of action of a lipid soluble hormone. That is, let's look at how a lipid soluble hormone causes changes in the metabolism and activity of its target cell. So here we have a steroid hormone. Steroids, if you recall, are lipids. So they can cross the plasma membrane, moving down their concentration gradient to bind receptors in the cytoplasm in this case. The receptor is shown in blue. So after the steroid hormone binds a receptor, this hormone receptor complex, as it's called, moves through nuclear pores and enters the nucleus. There it binds to a specific gene, and in this particular case it turns the gene on. In other cases it could turn the gene off, but in this case it turns the gene on, causing the synthesis of messenger RNA. The messenger RNA then moves through the nuclear pore out into the cytoplasm where it's used to synthesize a specific protein. And that protein, depending on what it is, could have many effects. That protein could be a hormone itself that the cell is then going to secrete into the extracellular fluid. It could be an enzyme that catalyzes specific reactions. The bottom line is that the binding of the steroid to the receptor has caused changes in the cell by in this case, turning on a specific gene, which led to the production of a specific protein. So in summary, steroid hormones bind intracellular receptors that turn on or off genes. And that's how steroid hormones cause changes in their target cells. For all of the hormones that we're going to discuss in this module, I want you to be able to tell me their mechanism of action, that is, how they cause changes in their target cell. So basically, you're going to need to know the chemistry of each hormone. Is it lipid soluble? Is it hydrophilic? Now, this may sound difficult at first, but there are only six hormones that we're going to discuss that are steroid hormones. So basically you just need to remember which six hormones are the steroid hormones. All the others are going to be hydrophilic and bind receptors on the extracellular surface of the cytoplasm. So let's identify these six steroid hormones. 
They are the sex hormones, which you're probably at least casually familiar with, testosterone, progesterone, estrogen. And probably the hormones you are least familiar with are the corticosteroids, which are produced by the adrenal cortex. That's why they're called corticosteroids, because they're produced by the cortex of the adrenal gland. They are aldosterone, cortisone, and cortisol. Now, there are two ways you can go about committing these six steroid hormones to memory. You can remember, okay, sex hormones and corticosteroids. Or you can also remember that if you look, four out of the six hormones in and own. You have testosterone, progesterone, aldosterone, cortisone, and then you just have to remember to throw in estrogen and cortisol. So commit these six hormones to memory in terms of their chemistry. Remember that they are steroid hormones. If you remember their steroid hormones, you'll remember that they bind intracellular receptors and cause changes in gene expression of their target cells. All of the other hormones that we're going to discuss in contrast, are hydrophilic and charged. Therefore, they're not going to be able to cross the plasma membrane. Well, there is one exception we'll get to later, but that's the only one. So with that one exception, all other hormones we're going to discuss will bind receptors on the extracellular surface of the plasma membrane. Well, if these hormones are not steroids, what is their chemistry? Well, some of them will be proteins, such as growth hormone. Some of them will be glycoproteins, a combination of, well, mainly protein with a small moiety or carbohydrate component, such as follicle-stimulating hormone. And others are going to be modified amino acids, such as epinephrine. Now, I am not going to require that you identify any any hormone specifically as a protein or a glycoprotein or amine. I simply want you to know that they are charged or hydrophilic hormones. And again, all you have to remember is those six steroid hormones and that all of the others that we're going to discuss are charged or hydrophilic and therefore affect their target cells by binding receptors on the extracellular surface of the plasma membrane. So now that you understand that charged hormones, hydrophilic hormones, can't cross the plasma membrane but must bind receptors on the extracellular surface of the plasma membrane, let's look at three mechanisms of actions by which hydrophilic charged hormones can cause changes in their target cells. Hormones can bind receptors that are directly attached to ion channels, causing those ion channels to open and close. And this changes the flow of ions into or out of the cell. In this particular example, it causes the flow of ions into the cell, and that causes some kind of cellular response. For example, if it caused sodium channels to open, it could make a cell more likely to generate an action potential, just as an example. In other cases, the hormone binds a receptor that's attached to an enzyme, causing that enzyme, which completely passes through the plasma membrane, causing that enzyme on the intracellular surface of the plasma membrane to be turned on, catalyzing some reaction. And that causes changes inside the cell. A third mechanism of action is mediated by a G protein. So here we have a hormone and it binds to a receptor, but it doesn't directly cause changes inside the cell. Instead, it causes a sequence of events that produces a substance inside the cell, which is called a second messenger. And that substance causes some change inside the cell. It's, caused, it's called a second messenger because it's carrying the message of 
that hormone. The hormone is the first messenger. But it doesn't directly cause changes in the cell. Instead, it causes the formation of a substance within the cell, and then that substance causes changes within the cell. So these are three mechanisms of actions or ways in which hydrophilic charged hormones bind receptors and cause changes in the metabolism and activity of their target cells. Now that you have a basic understanding of how hormones bind receptors and cause changes in their target cells, I'd like to talk about antagonists and agonists. They are important because they can modify the effects of an endogenous ligand. Now, what do I mean by endogenous ligand? Well, something that's endogenous is produced by your body. So, neurotransmitters, hormones are all endogenous ligands. They're compounds that bind things that are produced inside of your body. However, there are many drug therapies, drugs, that bind the same receptors that your hormones bind and modify the effects of your hormones, or in some cases, neurotransmitters. In other words, agonists and antagonists can be introduced into the body and they can modify the effects of endogenous ligands. Let's talk first about agonists. So agonists are exogenous ligands, ligands introduced to the body that bind the same receptors that your hormones do and either they can have the same effects as your endogenous hormones or they can enhance the effects of your endogenous hormones. In this example from your book, we have an enhancing effect shown at the top where the agonist and the hormone binds to the receptor and has an enhanced effect. Or you can have the agonist by itself binding the receptor and having a similar effect. An example of an agonist would be, let's say an individual does not produce a normal amount of growth hormone. So growth hormone is given to the individual in the form of a medication or a pill. The exogenous growth hormone would bind the receptors and have the same effects that the endogenous hormone would have. An antagonist is a ligand that is introduced to the body, inside of the body, that blocks the effect of the endogenous ligand or hormone. For example, let's say someone is producing too much of a hormone. They may be prescribed a medication where the substance binds to the receptor but doesn't have an, the same effect that the hormone would have. So it takes up the receptor and blocks the access of the endogenous hormone to the receptor, therefore reducing the effect of the hormone. That would be an example of an antagonist. Now let's review the objectives of the screencast, explain the relationship between the chemistry of a hormone and its mechanism of action, List six steroid hormones. Describe hormone agonists and antagonists. The cardiac conduction system will be the topic of the next screencast.